scripture reading. I'll read the first and the odd-numbered verses, and we ask you to join together as you read the even-numbered verses, and let's stand as we read the Word of God. O come and let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The sea is His, He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. For He is our God and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Let's pray. Father, we do desire to know your ways. We desire to walk in your ways. Lord, we desire to know that rest that you have promised for your people. And so we ask, Lord, that by your spirit you would speak to our hearts today and lead us, Lord, in the right way that we might follow after you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, our Bible reading has brought us to Genesis chapters 28 and 29 this week. And so we encourage you to read them over and Study them and join with us tonight, 7 o'clock, as we gather to worship the Lord and to continue through the Bible. What a wonderful thing to be able to go through the entire Bible and find out what God's Word says. We are exhorted over and over in the Scriptures to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen that need not to be ashamed for the ability of rightly dividing the word of truth. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 28th chapter and verse 16 of that chapter. As Jacob has fled from his brother's wrath, has come to a place that will later be called Bethel. And we read, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Jacob is fleeing for his life. He has deceived his father and received the blessing that his father intended to give to his older twin brother Esau. Esau has consoled himself with the idea that as soon as dad dies, I'm going to kill that rat of a brother. And so he is comforting himself with this thought, I'm going to kill him. And when Jacob becomes aware of his brother's vow and deep anger, he decides to flee the scene. And thus, with his father's blessing, he takes off on a journey that will lead him some 400 miles to Haran, there at the edge of Babylon. 
the first night out, he makes it all the way to Bethel, which shows he's really moving. He's bone tired. He's weary. He's lonely. He's frightened. He uses a rock for a pillow. And immediately he falls into a deep sleep. A long journey, a guilty conscience, and a rock for a pillow are ingredients that make for dreams. And Jacob had a dream. And in this dream he saw a ladder from the earth that reached up into heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on this ladder. And the Lord stood at the top of the ladder and he spoke to Jacob these words. I am Jehovah, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. And I will give to you the land where you are lying and to your descendants. And your descendants will be in number as the sand of the sea and you will spread to the west and the east, the north and the south. And through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you in all places. I will bring you again into this land, and I will not leave you until I have accomplished all of the things that I have promised you. Basically, God is now repeating the covenant with Jacob that he gave to his grandfather Abraham and to his father Isaac, that God would multiply their descendants and that from one of their descendants would be the Messiah, that from their lineage the Messiah would come. God promised again to give him the land, even as he had promised to Abraham and to Isaac. And the promise also to be with him in this journey that he is now taking. The promise that he would bring him back into this land once again. And the promise that he would not forsake him until he had accomplished all of these things. Peter spoke about the exceeding rich and precious promises of God. And as we go through the Bible, we find that God has made so many rich and precious promises to us. He is now promising to Jacob these wonderful things. And Jacob surely is not deserving the things that God has promised to do. In fact, Jacob will later admit his unworthiness of all of the blessings that God has bestowed upon him. Not worthy the least of your mercies, he will declare. When Jacob awoke from this dream, He declared, truly, the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Last night, when he had arrived bone-weary, tired, frightened, lonely, he wasn't aware of God's presence, only of his own fear. Bethel is a very barren area. It is just a rocky hillside. Really, no trees, nothing of much growing upon it, just little 
shrubs, scrub brush. Nothing that would remind you of the presence of God. Usually, if we watch a beautiful sunset, we see the sky colored in the brilliant colors, and we then say, oh, isn't God wonderful? And, and it reminds us of, of the beauty of God's creation. If we're sitting under a coconut palm looking at the breaking surf in Hawaii, and we see the blue skies and the fleecy white clouds, we're prone to say, oh, isn't God good? And, and there, are, you know, it sort of reminds you of, of the presence of God. If you're standing on the bridge in Yosemite looking at those beautiful waterfalls, and you hear the thundering water as it crashes down the mountainside, you feel the spray on your face, you see the beautiful pine trees and all, and it sort of reminds you of, of God, and you say, oh, the grandeur of this place. God is so marvelous in his creation. But Bethel looks like God forgot it. <laughs> There's nothing there. It's just a rocky, barren area. In fact, the, the Jews even have a story of how that the angels were given rocks to distribute all over the world. And so they took off on this mission of distributing uh, the rocks, the two angels, and one went all over the world distributing the other rock, and the other angel was lazy, and he just dumped them all on Israel. And it is a barren place and nothing to suggest the presence of God. <laughs> Notice, he said, truly the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. That is, last night when I arrived here, I didn't know it. But now there's an awakened consciousness as the result of this dream, he is aware that God is in this place as lonely, as barren, as hopeless as it may be or seem to be, God is in this place. Last night when I arrived, I wasn't conscious of the presence of God. I was filled with fear and anxieties Behind me, and hopefully far behind me, is my brother Esau. Ahead of me is a long journey with an uncertain future. And so Jacob is sort of stuck with the fear of the past and the fear of the uncertainty of the future. And up to this point, this was probably the darkest hour of his entire life. It is interesting to me that so often in our darkest hours, God chooses to reveal himself to us. You remember Paul the Apostle. He had had a lifelong ambition to preach the gospel to his fellow Jews. He felt that he could convince them of the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus had told him that they won't accept you, but Paul figured he doesn't know me. Surely they will accept me. I know what, how they think, and I'm sure I can convince them. And so Paul finally had his opportunity and it ended in a riot, and they were ready to kill him. In fact, they were trying to kill him. And he was taken by the Roman soldiers into protective custody. His lifelong dream and ambition shattered 
a long, dark night in that Roman jail. But in that dark night, the Lord came to him and said, Paul, be of good cheer. Cheer up. Even as you have borne witness of me here in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness of me in Rome. He probably thought my ministry's over. I'm a total failure. I finally have my opportunity to share with my buddies and they now want to kill me. It's over. My ministry's over. But the Lord said, cheer up, Paul. I've got more work for you to do. You're going to bear witness of me in Rome. As Paul was on his journey to Rome, a prisoner still of Rome, as he was on this ship and this great storm came and for 14 days they were tossed there in the Mediterranean, not seeing the sun or the sky for 14 days in this fierce storm, until they had all given up hope of ever surviving. On that night, the 14th night, the Lord came to Paul and assured Paul that he was going to make it safely to shore with all of those that were on the ship, though the ship would be wrecked, not a life would be lost. And Again, in that dark night, in that night of hopelessness, the Lord appeared and ministered to him. So often in our dark nights, when we've about given up hope, when we can't see any future, when it seems like the world is closing in around us, it is in those times that the Lord so often chooses to reveal himself to us. And so it was with Jacob, this dark night of his life, filled with fear, filled with anxiety, uncertainty, the Lord chose to reveal himself unto Jacob truly. The Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. I wonder why it is that it oftentimes takes great tragedy, personal tragedy, to bring a person to the awareness of God. Jacob was an extremely resourceful person. He was willing to take advantage of another person's weaknesses. He was able to scheme and pull off a ruse to get his own will accomplished. It seemed like he didn't need God. He was very capable on his own. But God brought him to the end of his resources in order that God might reveal himself to Jacob. All of the cunning in the world cannot deliver him now from his brother's wrath and his brother's anger. His only hope is in God and the help of God. He no doubt felt very forsaken. He's got to flee from the security of his family. He's traveling alone across that long journey to Haran. And it is very possible that his own sense of guilt lay heavily upon him. I'm in this dreadful condition because I did wrong. And maybe that was just heavily upon him and he felt Surely, God is far away. God is not concerned with me. How can I ever hope to be in touch with God? 
There he had a dream in this condition. In the dream, the ladder that reached on up into heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending. And the Lord standing at the top of the ladder and giving him now hope, giving him assurance, giving him these glorious promises. When Jacob awoke the next morning, he said, How awesome is this place! This is the house of God. This is the gate to heaven. It is interesting when you go to the New Testament, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, Jesus makes an interesting comment that refers to this dream of the ladder that goes to heaven upon which the angels were ascending and descending. It's when Philip had brought Nathanael to Jesus. And Jesus, when he saw Nathanael, said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathanael said, How do you know me? And Jesus said, Before Philip called you, when you were sitting there under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael said, Truly you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said, Because I told you I, I saw you under the fig tree, you said, Sick around, man. You haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Henceforth, you're going to see the heavens open and the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus is declaring, I am the ladder by which heaven touches earth and earth touches heaven. I am the ladder by which man can reach heaven. I am the gate to heaven. And later on, he made that very claim that he was the gate to the sheepfold. But here he declares, from now on you're going to see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending, declaring that he is that ladder that Jacob saw, whereby man can touch God and God touches man. I wonder just where you might be today. Has the past finally caught up with you? Have you come to the end of your own resourcefulness? Are you weary and tired from running? Does it seem that God is far removed from your life? That is just where Jacob was when he had his first encounter, real encounter with God. Jacob knew of God. He knew the faith of his grandfather, Abraham. He knew the faith of his father, Isaac. But he had never had his own personal encounter with God. This is Jacob's first real encounter with God. And it came in that dark, dark night of his own loneliness and weariness and fearfulness. That is where God first met Jacob and gave him assurance and gave him the promises of the future. It took the despair to bring him to the place of hope. Does Jacob then live happily ever after? Unfortunately, no. He is still Jacob. He is still a man of cunning abilities. He's still willing to take advantage and to deceive if necessary. It isn't yet out of his system. God is going to have to deal with him even more 
before he can bring him to the place that he can really use him. In fact, even in this very situation, you see, oh, cunning Jacob, even trying to make a deal with God. Uh, you read it there at the end of the chapter as he, as he seeks to sort of strike this deal with God. Jacob rose up in the morning. He took the stone that he had put for his pillows and he set it up for a pillar, poured oil on top of it, and he called the name of the place Bethel, which means house of God. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothes to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall Jehovah be my God. And this stone that I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you will give to me, I'll give you a tenth. <laughs> Make a deal with you, God. Go with me. Feed me. Clothe me. Bless me. Bring me back safely. Make me rich and I'll split it with you. I'll give you 10%. <laughs> Making his deal with God. You see, he's still Jacob. He's still that conniver. There will be other experiences necessary to bring him to the place where God wants him, but this is the beginning and or always has to be the beginning of your relationship with God. You're not perfect the first day you begin your walk with God. There's a lot of the old self-life that has yet to be dealt with. But God is faithful, and in a couple of weeks we will be seeing the faithfulness of God in bringing Jacob now to the real end of himself where he changes him from Jacob to Israel. Jacob means conniver, schemer, rotten scoundrel, <laughs> heel catcher, literally. And God is going to change his name to Israel, governed by God. But first of all, he's going to learn a few things. He's going to learn that chickens come home to roost. And we'll be talking about that next Sunday as we look at this next chapter in Jacob's life and how the deceiver becomes deceived. How whatever a man sows, that he also reaps. But how God finally brings him to the end of himself. And he becomes no longer Jacob. No longer the heel catcher. But a man who is governed by God. What a glorious day. When God, through circumstances, brings us to the end of ourselves. And our life begins to be governed fully by the Holy Spirit and by the Lord. So we've got a couple of interesting lessons coming up in the next couple of weeks as we watch the work of God in taking this man from what he was to what God wanted him to be. And hopefully and prayerfully, God's going to do that with some of you taking you from what you are to what he wants you to be. But it all begins with your first encounter. That's the important step. This is the first encounter, personal encounter, that Jacob had with God. This is the beginning of the relationship. It'll grow, but it takes the beginning. It could be that some of you are in a dark place right now in your own life. Things are going to pieces. You want to run. You don't know where to go. And it's very possible that God has brought you to this very place of desperation 
that you might find him in that dark night of your life? If so, if you will truly discover God, you will find that one day you'll look back on this as the best day of your life. The day that the circumstances drove you to put your reliance and trust in him. Because the minute you do that, then he makes his promises to you. He'll keep you. He'll bring you back safely. He'll take care of you. He'll watch over you. I pray that this will be the day for many of you that you have your first real experience in discovering God. And like Jacob, you can say, truly the Lord is in this place. This is the gate to heaven, the house of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way that you deal with us drawing us to yourself, bringing to pass circumstances that leave us in a place of hopelessness and despair, where we are more or less forced to cry out to you. Lord, there are some in that condition today who are here. They're here out of desperation, they're looking for answers. They're looking for help. And Lord, we're so thankful that you are here to help them and to lift them out of their circumstances, out of the miry clay in which they are sinking, and to establish their feet upon the rock and to lead them, Lord, in your path. And so may their hearts be open and may they respond and May they have their Bethel experience discovering the presence of God in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. <clears throat> In a few chapters, we're going to find God telling Jacob to return to Bethel. Come back to that place where you first encountered God. And maybe God is calling some of you back to Bethel this morning. You've sort of strayed from that relationship and that experience. And God is calling you back to that place where you first met him. Start over again. Begin again that journey with him. Maybe you've never had a Bethel. Maybe you've never experienced the presence of God. And yet, you feel your need of God. You feel a sense of hopelessness and despair with the things that are taking place in the world today. This is the dark night of your life which God wants to transform and bring you into the consciousness and the awareness of his love and of his promises that he is willing to make to you. The pastors are down here at the front and they're here to pray for you this morning. So if you would like to come back to Bethel or if you've never had that first encounter, I would encourage you as soon as we're dismissed, come forward. Because God is wanting to become God to you. He wants to become the top priority of your life. He wants you to know his love. He wants you to know his purpose and his plan for you. He wants to take away the darkness and the loneliness and the fears so that you can live in confidence and assurance of his grace and of his love to you. And so, instead of just leaving, come forward and 
meet God. And you'll go away a different person. Like Jacob, you'll be saying, truly the Lord is in this place. I didn't know it. As you've come, become aware of God's love and goodness. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. Now, on behalf of the Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact the Word for Today at the Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.